and there it is already. Romans chapter 5, verse 2, one more time. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. One more time. Who is the him? Through him. That's a pronoun. Who is it? Okay, you could say Jesus. You could say Christ. I would say it, Paul has used a designation for him. Let's use the whole thing. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord. See, the thing is, Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is God the Son. Jesus is all those things. And you could ask every man on the street, well, who's Jesus? And they're going to say, ah, oh, Jesus, son of God. Yeah. They're going to say all that. But is he their Lord? There's a deficiency right then. It is not enough just to simply have a head knowledge of who he is. Remember, use present tense, please, of who he is. We have to look at who he is in his entirety. Is he your Lord? Is he the master of your life? It gives us pause to think. Who is on the throne of our lives? And sometimes we've seen these, these tracks with these cute little illustrations there. Am I sitting on the throne of my life? Or is he? Have I displaced myself and enshrined him in the center of my life? Oh, that's a good question, isn't it? That's a great question. In fact, that's one of the best questions ever. We already enjoy peace with the Father through him, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we have gained access to the throne room of grace again through Jesus Therein we stand. We see that word, word was that, uh, yeah, there it is right there. Into this grace in which we stand. Do we stand there temporarily? As long as we're, we behave well? Do we st stand there only as long as, you know, we do good things? What's the designation? of the word stand. We stand there permanently. Because we stand there for all time, you and I can do what? It says we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So we rejoice, we exult, we celebrate, you know, celebrate good times. Come on! And then we have a great song. It's, it's already been used? Sorry. It, it is, I suppose it's a de deficiency of us because we think we're not there in heaven, in the throne room of God, that we're, we're not going to celebrate now. In fact, we are, we are commanded to praise and give glory to him in the here and now for that. And we're to do that in the hope of the glory of God. Now, if you weren't here last week, and several of you weren't, and I know you wish you were, we looked at that word hope and gave it a truer meaning of the word. The biblical word hope is not wishful thinking, it's not a fantasy, it's not an imaginary thinking, it's not a hankering for something that's in our imagination. I can say, oh, I hope it's 80 degrees tomorrow. That's kind of wishful thinking, isn't it? I can say that I hope all that I want. It's probably not going to happen. In fact, we often use the expression, I hope, like, oh, I hope 
Mom brings home quarter pounders with cheese from Burger King. No, that's McDonald's. We can say we hope for this and we hope for that. And I've often thought, I use the word hope to kind of help myself get over the disappointment when the thing I want doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I hope I get a new gun for my birthday. <laughs> I say that getting myself ready for the disappointment that Darlene is not going to get me a new gun for my birthday. So I'm kind of getting myself ready for, the, for a letdown. When we run across the word hope in scripture, that is not how it's being used. We have to look at it in the sense that biblical hope is the expectation of a future event that is for sure going to happen. It just hasn't happened yet. It is future, but it's going to happen. I can wish all I want for something about something, and it's not going to make it happen. The man that stands before you today hoped that at one point he would stand on the podium at the Olympic Games while the red, white, and blue was being raised and the Star Spangled Banner played while they draped a gold medal around his neck. I hoped for that. And then along came reality. I discovered about me, one, I didn't have the inclination to put into the, the time into preparing what was needed to accomplish that. And two, I had topped out my talent anyway. I could get a little better, but not much. I hoped for that, only to see that goal glimmering. The hope of the glory of God, as we see here in verse 2, is not a fantasy. We can expect to bask in God's own glory. Friends, it's the real deal. We're just not in it yet. Or are we? Are we in the glory of God at this point? Most believers would say, no, well, that's, that's too calm, that's too... And as we look at this, I would perhaps disagree. Let's look at this. Having been justified, right? Having been made right. Having been reconciled to God as our Father. As we continue to be conformed to the image of His Son, having the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, I would ask, are we not presently in the here and now in the glory of God? Amen. Yes. Now, sometimes we've got to take these, these paradigms that we have, and I'm like, you know what a paradigm is? Ooh, I use the word. A paradigm is a mental construct that we have that we believe is true. And there's no shaking us from that. The earth is the center of the universe, and all the celestial objects go around the earth. Did you? Now, we had science class many years ago. Did we not learn that was, that was true? That's what the ancients believed. Earth is the center because God made it, and everything goes around the earth. The geocentric theory, right? Remember that? Just not. Along came Copernicus and went, oh. Galileo proved it with his telescope. What happened to him? Galileo for proving, sorry, the earth is not. We go around the sun. You, you know what they did to him? They condemned him to death because he went again the, against the paradigm of the time. They didn't execute him, but he had to recant. A paradigm is a mental construct that we have that we can't shake. Well, let's shake one here today. First of all, do we all understand, we, we continue to repeat that, 
If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, your eternal life does not start in the sweet by and by when they, whatever, unplug us from the machine or when we close our eyes. That is not when we start our eternal life. Do we all understand that? You are already in your eternal life in the here and now. Do you get that? You have to get that. We've got to. I, I know we. I, I even like that song, "In the Sweet By and By." Okay, and that is true. But we we also need to understand this: that as believers, we're already in our eternal life. Therefore, there's that word again. More, I like that word. Therefore, we are already in His glory. It may not seem like that. The day after we became believers, we got up and the sun still rose in the west and set in the east. <laughs> Some of you caught that. Everything still looked the same. I still had to shave. I still had to have my breakfast. Everything was still the same. I was transformed. Before we bring up the next sentence. Uh, let me read the first seven words of verse 3. Okay, first seven words. Not only that, the glory of God, we rejoice in, we would pause and go, there's more to rejoice in besides the glory of God? I like it, Bob. Tell me what it is. Can you not wait to discover what else we rejoice in? We look here at, at 3A, right here. Not only that, rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and so on. Okay, we all get this. Rejoicing in the glory of God. We rejoice in good stuff. It now goes against our, our mindset to discover that we are to rejoice in something that is decidedly unpleasant. Right? Admit it. I am. I confess to that. As increasingly astute students of scripture, all of us, we are aware of two things. One, we need to know more about him and we need to know more about us. Who was ever born that went through life unimpeded by sorrow? Who in this room has not been touched by sorrow? Nobody. We all have. Yes? Mm -hmm. Disappointments, betrayals, loss of job, sudden passings. What is being spoken of here, this suffering, is not the typical aches and pains and unexpected unhappiness that characterizes all human life. That's not what this suffering is referring to. We've all been touched by physical infirmities and, and other seeming tragedies that go on in life. That's not what it's talking about. The sorrow that's referred to here is that which the believer endures for the sake of his Savior's name. What Paul is establishing in this sentence is a chain of qualities which is to be developed in us, which leads to being conformed to the image of Christ. Let's read all of three through five, and as we've already discovered, Paul likes sequence of events. This leads to this, which leads to this, which leads to this, and so on. Paul likes lists. I do too. So let's see where we rejoice in the hope of heaven and also we rejoice in suffering also. This appears to be contradictory. 
Reading 3 through 5, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. There is an end result which is desired, and going through tribulation is a necessary part to that end. Someone who is not mature in their faith, when a sudden event comes along that is a trial, a test, a seeming tragedy, they could say, what did I do to deserve this? Have you known those who have said it? Perhaps we have said it our own selves, right? Mm -hmm. I can understand that the individual is not mature to the point of recognizing the hand of God in everything that occurs in the wonderful things that happen and also the things that bring sorrow. For the one who wants an insurance policy, they get saved so they don't burn. Okay, I confess to that when I was a little boy when I got saved, that was my primary motivation. Get the insurance policy. I wanted to avoid eternal punishment. Suffering for Jesus is an unexpected surprise. There are those out there who have what, what we term abundance mentality. Whom God loves, he's going to make rich. Whoa. That's the way the Pharisees thought and taught. Do we have people who still do? Yep. Absolutely. So abundance mentality in the here and now is not scriptural. Neither is the thought of inviting persecution to win points with God. So we, we have these two extremes here. Someone who says, um, I'll be a believer now, I can, I'm going to have everything that this life offers. I'm God's child and he wants his children to be happy. And so I'm going to give all these material blessings. That's one extreme. It is, okay, it's not unscriptural. It's anti-scriptural, okay? But you also have somebody at the other extreme saying, I'm a Christian, hurt me. I want to suffer for Jesus. Bring up. Are, there, are there those out there also? Yeah, there are. There may be a tendency to overemphasize the positive promises of being a believer to the neglect of the assurances that we too may have occasion to walk in his steps. Do we understand that expression, walk in his steps? Oh, Jesus, he had a great time when he was here on earth, right? Everything was wonderful, everything was just, yeah. We refer to Jesus' sojourn on this earth as uh, his sufferings, his, um, I'm looking for another word, it's not, it's not coming, I have it. The great man is still working. His condescension. He condescended to go from there with everything that is to here, everything that is here. So he condescended, that's what we mean to say, walk in his steps. Jesus is referred to as man of sorrows. This word suffering implies the squeezing of olives in a press to get out the oil. Because sometimes when you want to get something out of someone, you got to put on a little pressure. The heart of Jesus' teaching is the Sermon on the Mount. That's something to commit to your mind. That's the core of his teaching. The Sermon on the Mount it starts with, again, a list. What, what's that list called? Sermon on the Mount. Starts off with? 
Blessed are, those are called the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. Here in the Beatitudes, we see the Lord was anticipating what life would be like for his followers. Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted. For why? For righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he doubles down on it. I like that expression, double down. He goes on to say, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. There's no period on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Do note, the persecution is on his account. The hatred Satan and his minions have for the Son of God is directed at us. If Jesus himself was persecuted here, are you and I immune from the same treatment? Oh, it's really quiet in here. Inside you're going, no, we're not immune. Let me pause here to say, living in the U.S. of A, with the heritage that this country has to a large degree, even in the here and now, you and I have a pretty easy life living for Christ. True, it has changed in these last couple decades decidedly. We start to see the culture that once revered Christians as being the salt and light of the nation, it's now changed to seeing us as, as at very best, just we don't count anymore. We're irrelevant. But now we see that even changing into overt hostility. I recited to you the height of last year's protest. One guy who was holding the sign that said, if Jesus returns, crucify him again. Now, what was in that young man's mind holding that sign? I don't know. Well, maybe I do know. But we start to see that instead of being salt and light, you and I are now being viewed as a detriment. And when we go through all this, it's, it was always in the back of my mind, suffering for Christ's sake, you and I haven't had to do much of that, have we? Perhaps you in some subtle ways at work, at school, in your home, that there is there's subliminal, attitude that's been generated, that's been directed at you, that, yeah, he, he's a religious freak. You know, he's a, he's a Jesus uh, follower. Just, you know, perhaps that's happened to you, but you, we have to admit, we've had it pretty easy, haven't we? But I think it's going to change. And even though we may not be experiencing what our brothers and sisters in the past experience, we need to be warned now of what may happen. Did I say may? Slap my face. What is going to happen in the future? Yeah, it's coming. John chapter 15, verses 18 through 20. Jesus said, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But, because you are not of the world, but I choose, but, sorry, but I chose, I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, 
A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Indeed, when a believer suffers for Christ here, who in actuality is being persecuted? Don't get this, why are you always picking on me? That was a great song too. Don't get the attitude, why are they picking on me? In reality, if you're a believer and something happens, some form of persecution, who is being persecuted? Christ. I can wait. Christ. Christ is. Our Lord is. Do you recall the story of Saul on the road to Damascus? Breathing out th threatenings and dangers to the believers. He has already been responsible for the killing of Christians in Jerusalem. He's on his way to Damascus with papers granting him to be able to do the same to arrest believers in Christ and bring them back to Rome so that they too could be dealt with. While he was on the road to Damascus, he got knocked off his, his animal by the glory of God. And as he's lying there in the dirt, he looks up in this, this blinding light and says, who are you, Lord? What was said to him? Do you know the story? If not, oh, it's a goodie. I am Jesus, who you persecute. And the man came to the realization that yes, he was doing these things to individuals who were flesh and blood, but in actuality, he was persecuting God himself. That's what he came to the realization with. When you and I will suffer persecution for the sake of the name, that's what they entitled it at that time. The word Christian had not come into existence yet. But when they were being persecuted for the name, Jesus is being persecuted. Do not think that what we endure for being called Christian, which means little Christ, goes unnoticed in heaven. In 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, we read, so we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, temporary, passing away. But the things that are unseen are eternal. We are told that the affliction is momentary. We're told that it's light. And what it is doing is getting us ready for eternal glory. 2 Timothy 10 through 12. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me in Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Let me pause to point out this is 2 Timothy. This is the last letter that Paul wrote. He's in the dungeon. He, he's not in the, the how, under house arrest like he was previously. He, he, he had uh, two in, in, uh, incarcerations. This he's in prison. He's in the dungeon. He is going to die. 
He's not getting out of this one. He has no plea. He's going to die, and he knows that when you read 2 Timothy, you're reading the writings of a man who is going to die. And as you read that, you can see the tone in it, a man who's come to the end, but who reflects on not look at what I have done, but on what God has allowed him to accomplish through the name of Christ. He has recognized that his persecutions have served as seed, as the blood of martyrs does, to raise new believers. It appears as though persecution is contingent on whether we desire to live a godly life or not. Can, can, it begs the question, can a Christian lead a marginal life out in the world and not undergo some persecution? Well, I, some people say the level of your Christian life is contingent on the amount of persecution that you endure. If you're leading a Christian life, you will be persecuted. If you're not being persecuted, you're not leading a Christian life. Well, I suppose that's, that's individual, and I suppose that depends on the circumstances. But for those people, it, it, what's important is for those people that you are around is to know that you're a believer, and that you are steadfast in your faith. And that there could be, will be, hopefully, a time in their life because they have seen the consistency of testimony in you that they will come to you and inquire about your faith and you can tell them about the Lord Jesus. There are those who believe the Christian life is all sunshine and roses, that loving Jesus guarantees health and wealth in this life and endless bliss in the next. And then along come trials and tribulations. Their disappointment is based in their deception of what they thought the Christian life would be, only discover that the narrow way, we talk about the narrow way being the way of salvation, the narrow way not only means that there is only one way to salvation, but also means the believer's manner of living is narrow itself and to live in a way worthy to be called Christian invites the world scorn. The woman of virtue that we read about, I'm sure she had her times with her friends, but we read about a woman who is devoted to her faith and to her household, period. She is not distracted by the allurements of the world. She's not being told this and that by false voices to be dissatisfied with her position in life. We, that often brings up uh, men and women. Who do you listen to? Who's whispering things in, in your ear that, well, you don't deserve this, you shouldn't be treated that way, and you may not deserve to be treated that way. Well, you need to take this action and that action. Do you, do you listen to those voices before you listen to the voice of, of your Lord giving you direction? There are many accounts of the church's persecution through its history. Persecution began immediately as the apostles were brought before the Sanhedrin the very ones who delivered Jesus to his death. Greg, as you bring up Acts 5, here's the setting. Jesus died, was buried, was risen, displayed himself numerous times, one time to over 500 people. The faith, instead of being squelched, grows, much to the chagrin of those who had committed Jesus to death, they're, they're just insanely mad that their plot had failed. And so they are after the, now the core leaders of the group, they're after the apostles. And they bring them before the Sanhedrin, this is the Jewish high court. And we read here in Acts chapter five, verse 27, and when they had brought them, 
they sent them before the council, the apostles. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charge you not to teach in this name. And yet, here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood on us. Uh-huh. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to those things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. And when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. We skip now to verse 40. And when they, the Sanhedrin, had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And you're going to tell already how effective that was, right? Then they left the presence of the council doing what, friends? Look at that. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Recall that we are using Romans 5, 3, which says we rejoice in the glory of God and we rejoice in suffering as a foundation for all this. And there could be so much more. We're just giving a, a, a sample here. But this passage is just classic lines. We must obey God rather than men. God exalted him, Jesus, at his right hand. We are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And what is relevant to the subject, um, verse 41, rejoicing that they were worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Yeah, these, these guys are in an entirely different spiritual plane than you and I are at. Were they inviting suffering? No, but if it was a derivative, if it was a, a natural result of their preaching Christ crucified, then they gladly accepted it. As the apostle who had and would suffer mightily, Paul, Greg, as you go back to Romans 5, 3. Paul said, as we looked at that 2 Timothy, he had suffered and would suffer mightily. He wrote again in 5.3, not only that, the rejoice of the hope of glory of God, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, not only to steal our resolve as disciples, enduring and maintaining our witnesses while being scorned, mocked, ridiculed, rejected, tormented, and so on, brings honor to the one who saves and keeps us. Everything that would be heaped upon us as believers, and it's going on right now around the globe in areas that are overtly hostile to believers, it brings honor to the Lord. And last, 1 Peter 4.19. There's that word again, therefore. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Again, we see the word suffer. In, in this letter, 1 Peter, suffer is used 16 times. It is the key word to this letter written by Peter. It is addressed to exiles who have apparently had to flee their homes because of persecution. 
We see that what they are doing is according to God's will. Nothing happens unless he has ordained it to be. Just who are those who are suffering? In this verse it says, those who have entrusted their souls to a faithful creator. That word entrust, that's a banking word. It means putting something into deposit for safekeeping. They have entrusted their souls to their creator. What was happening while they were being persecuted? Look at the verse. While doing good. What good were they doing? Although unstated, okay, it's not there. I can guess what good it was that they were doing. It was keeping their testimony and it was sharing their testimony. So while we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, we are also to rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces a hope which will not put us to shame and which will also not put him to shame. 